Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to It's an Evolution. Uh, yeah, I did kind of change the name a little bit, Viva La Evolution. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Johnny Wynn. On the internets, I'm known as Johnny Rugger. Most people ask me, why are you Johnny Rugger and not Johnny Wynn on the internets? Uh, so I used to play rugby. I'm retired, which is rugby speak for my wife won't let me play anymore. Um, apparently after you know, knee surgery, broken arm, um, I can tell you some great rugby stories. She's like, you know, you use those hands for coding, so, and she's always afraid I'm going to get head trauma. <laughs> so anyway, so yes, some of you may know, have heard of, how many have heard of the Elixir Fountain? So everybody's going to go out and listen to the Elixir Fountain tomorrow, right? Yeah. No, y'all aren't. Because <laughs> it's not coming out until Monday is when the episode's coming out. <laughs> um, so yeah, we talk mainly about Elixir, but I also cover topics from around the Beam ecosystem. I've had Joe on, I've had uh, Robert on, uh, you know, trying to get more people on and you know, try to build the community, not just Elixir, but try to get everybody involved. Uh, by day, I'm a developer. Uh, I work for an enterprise company. Uh, I'm not allowed to disclose that information. Well match. Um, I build mostly back-end services. Um, today, we're going to talk about something completely different. I'm not going to tell you about all that kind of fun stuff, which is really boring because it's healthcare. Uh, I'm going to talk about genetics and evolution. Now, there's a bit of a disclaimer for this talk. I am not a geneticist. I know it's shocking, but it's true. Um, but I don't even play one on TV, which is really bad. So you're probably asking right now, why do I know, or why am I giving this talk? Well, I do know something about spawning child processes. Yes, there's seven of them for those that are slow at math. They are all mine. Well, I say that. My wife and I have a very unique situation. So it's what's referred to as yours, mine, and ours. She had two, I had three. Uh, together we have two. Can you guess whose is whose? Maybe, maybe not. It's funny because when we all go out in public, everybody almost always assumes that they're all our kids. Now, you know, it, there's a funny story. So this is Ricky, my stepson. Everybody say hi, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Because he's going to watch this video later, and so now he knows everybody said hi to him. So I was visiting him in college, because he's off at college. He's going to Florida State University, which I'm very proud of, because I was born and raised in Seminole. Um, I was hanging out with him and some of his friends. We were waiting to go to one of the football games, and one of his friends came up and was like, ah, you two look so alike. You're like identical. And we both look at each other and kind of laugh. We're like, he's my stepson. <laughs> but I mean, the funny thing, you know, some of it has to do with, I mean, we've been around each other for 10 years, and a lot of that comes out, you know, just mannerisms, you know, you're being around the same environment, you know, we probably have the same postures and things like that, but we also all have blue eyes, and plus my wife and I look fairly similar, actually, you know, we both have brown hair, we both kind of look about the same, that whole Irish heritage sort of thing, but, um, but you know, it's funny about the blue eyes piece is, so you'll figure out a little bit more about this later, but so blue eyes is actually a recessive gene. So it's supposedly going by the wayside, you know, because eventually, since it's recessive, it'll eventually kind of work its way out of the gene pool. I think red, uh, red hair is another thing that's kind of, now, by on the way out when it comes to genetics could mean another 50, 100, 200 years, but it just means it's going to become uh, less prominent. But there's a darker side to genetics, and I want to talk about this. So this is Ricky. I'm going to take you back about, I guess, nine years, I guess it was, something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm a dad, so I don't really remember how old he was in fourth grade. But we had had a great summer. We had spent the summer you know, doing all sorts of fun stuff. My wife and I had only been together probably about a year and stuff. And so we were traveling around doing a lot of things. But we noticed that he was drinking a lot of fluids, like constantly thirsty. It's like every time we turned around, he was thirsty. And then he would almost immediately turn around and go to the bathroom. Well, having had some trouble with like di or diabetes before, and his, his grandfather is actually a type 1 diabetic, you know, we started getting a little concerned. And so we went and took him to, have, to get tested for diabetes. And, you know, of course, you're waiting for the test results. Here comes the first day of fourth grade. My wife, who was a teacher at the school that he was attending, was in class, and she gets a call first thing in the morning. It's the doctor's office. Can you bring Ricky in? Well, yeah, it's the first day of school. Can we do it, like, say, Friday? Because, you know, I'm teaching. I've got a class that I've got. He's, he's just getting his. She goes, well, when we say can you bring him in, we mean, like, can you bring him in this morning and not to the doctor's office, to the hospital. So he spent the first three days of fourth grade in a hospital bed trying to get his blood sugars down from 500. Now, if you don't know what your blood sugar should be, how many people know what your blood sugar should be? 
Yeah, it's like 80 to 100. So the fact that he was over 500 was like really scary, and they were really concerned about it. Now, obviously, because all the kids don't have type 1 diabetes, this is, this is probably a recessive, uh, a recessive gene, or I would assume it's a recessive gene. Now, in conversations I had, I know I saw him come in here somewhere. Yeah, he's back there. He's a doctor. He told me that it's also possible that you know, some type of environmental thing triggered it. Yes, maybe it's hereditary. Well, they're pretty positive it's hereditary, but it may have been triggered by something in the environment. He could have got sick, I think is what you said, like a virus or something like that that could have... Okay, so that's still all up in the air. But it brings up another concern. So my son, who's, isn't he cute? <laughs> so this is my youngest. He's five. I think this picture is probably four. Notice those big blue eyes. Everybody does, so take the time. Let's all take the time and look at it. He's also drinking uh, Gatorade, which is hilarious because I just told you that kids were drinking sugary drinks all the time. But anyway, my wife is kind of concerned. Because all the other kids seem fine, but he's also young. And so it's kind of like, well, is he going to get diabetes? Is he going to get Because I couldn't imagine having to give him a shot. You know, for the first you know, several years until, he, until Ricky got on the pump, he was actually taking insulin. So, but this brings us to gametes. So, and that's part of the reproductive process where like, when reproduction happens, you actually split your DNA and you give half of it over and that's a gamete that's passed on to the next generation. And so we don't know. It could be my wife could have passed that over. She might not have. Uh, but understanding these processes is going to help us build our Petri dish. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to start with covering uh, a brief hif history of evolution. Uh, we're going to look at kind of what Darwin discovered when he made his major voyage and found the Galap Galapagos Islands. <laughs> But we're also going to get some simple genetics. Now, remember that disclaimer, I'm not a geneticist, so I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to keep it simple. We're wanting to showcase kind of what OTP can do and some of the ways that I use to create it. Uh, but we do need to have a basic understanding of some genetic processes so that we can make sure that we replicate them as close as possible. Um, although uh, there's going to be some parts where I'm sure I don't have to tell the doctor in the back to cover his ears. Um, and then we're going to build stuff. We're going to actually see some code, believe it or not. I'm not just going to sit up here and run my mouth. Although I might sit up here and run my mouth, but we'll see some code on the screen. So let's get started. The world in 1831. Everybody remembers that, right? <laughs> well, it was a very different world from what we know today, uh, especially with our understanding of evolution. Up until this point, uh, remember that... Uh, most scholars largely supported the idea of design, a divine design in nature. In fact, Darwin himself studied William Paley's, everybody knows William Paley, right? Dave, you met him before, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, William Paley wrote the, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to read this one because it's, uh, it's a big one. Natural theology or evidences of the ex or existence and attributes of the deity. Now, Darwin studied this at Cambridge. But in 1931, Darwin set out on a two-year journey on the HMS Beagle. He was a self-funded and very green, no pun intended, naturalist on board the ship, but he wasn't even the chief naturalist. That job actually belonged to Robert McCormick, and he was the, the ship surgeon. This was supposed to be a two-year uh, voyage that turned into five years, hence the feature creep. This also sounds like some other story that I've heard about. Um, everybody remembers Gilgan's Island, right? Okay, I'm not, okay. I know some people in here have to. Um, so the interesting part about the voyage uh, came when they discovered the Galapagos Islands. So Darwin noted that mockingbirds uh, on the islands, although similar to the ones that are found in mainland Chile, had small variations, and they even varied from island to island. But it was also the tortoises. Each island had tortoises with very unique shell patterns. These variations would suggest that although uh, a species may have, uh, may have originated from a single species, isolation and natural selection uh, caused variations to emerge uh, that helped the species survive in a given environment. Now this is one of my favorite quotes because it seems like it probably applies to developers as well as, um, I guess, natural selection. 
the best developers are the ones that are responsive to change. Um, now, of course, these ideas that Darwin had and he's presenting go against most of the, what was commonly accepted at the time as divine design. And of course, Dar Darwin would go on to publish Origin of Species uh, and pretty much be considered the father of modern evolution, or the fa father of modern e evolution theory. So now we're going to get to some genetics. And we need to understand some of the simple genetics so we can see how variations uh, can go from generation to generation. Gregor Mendel. Now, he was a monk at St. Thomas Abbey, uh, and he experimented on pea plants. And the time was around 1956 to 1963. You're probably asking why pea plants. Uh, pea plants are actually what's considered now a, a model organism uh, because they're, they're easy to maintain and breed in the laboratory setting. Uh, at the time, it was common thought that genes were passed on through blended inheritance. Now, blended inheritance is when the average of the two parents' traits get passed on. Uh, let's take into consideration height. Say we have a set of parents like this. Now, with blended inheritance, what we would say is the offspring would be the average of those heights. Well, as you can see, with the next generation, everything gets kind of close, similar together. Now, if you keep going down this chain, eventually everything is going to kind of go across, and everybody would be exactly the same height. We can also see this when we use limited sample sizes. Uh, when we first run our experiment today, we're going to actually have just two organisms that start the whole pool. And in a relatively short amount of time, we're going to see very similar makeup uh, to the identity of each organism. Um, now, Mendel focused, and I know this is probably hard to see in the back, but Mendel focused basically on plant traits. Uh, the traits are phenotypes. Phenotypes is another word for traits. Uh, he focused on the, the, the color, the shape, the height, uh, the, like the flower variations and things like that. And he noticed that they weren't always an average. In fact, he noticed that some traits were dominant and recessive. Today, has anybody seen a Punnett square? Awesome. Uh, so today we can use this to, to track Mendelian inheritance. Uh, basically what a Punnett square is, is you take the, the parental and the or, uh, parental and uh, uh, paternal, I'll get that right eventually, um, paternal and maternal, and you can actually see the dominant. Now, in this case, we have uh, two, uh, uh, two heterozygote uh, uh, parents where we have the big G, little y, big G, little y. We're using these to say green and yellow because we're talking about plants. And so the big G or the big letter when you see something like this is generally the dominant trait. The little letter is the, the recessive trait. Now, when we run through this, we can actually see that if these two parents actually produced offspring, we would actually have 50% of the time we would have green with a yellow recessive, 25% of the time we would have just green dominant, and 25% of the time you would actually produce yellow plants. Well, what happens if we actually use uh, a, a parent with uh, homozygote, which would be the two of the same? And so we could take that, and these would almost always be 100%. Well, in this case, they would always be 100% green because you would always have the dominant green trait there. Now, taking this another step further, we can do multiple. So in this case, we take the color trait and we also take the height trait, which big T, little t is going to be our height. And so we're going to say, you know, when you actually do out the Punnett square, you actually come to a ratio more like this, where 50% or 56% of the time, now these aren't to the actual number, these are rounded, but 56% of the time we're going to have tall green plants 19% of the time, we'll have yellow tall. 19% of the time, we'll have yellow short. short yeah, and then 6% of the time, we'll have yellow. So in a very small percentage, we'll actually produce uh, short yellow plants. So what came from Mendel's uh, findings became known as Mendel's Law. Uh, the first Mendel's Law was Law of Segregation. When gametes form, meaning you split, a parent splits its DNA to send over for reproduction, the gene is actually split and only one allele. So when you, the big G, little g, or, or big G, little y, I guess I used, uh, that would be, those are each alleles in each trait. So only one of those alleles is passed over in the offspring. The law of independent uh, assortment means that <clears throat> the selection of one, tri uh, one trait has nothing to do with the, uh, the other trait. So the fact that you passed over the green trait does not necessarily mean you're going to pass over the tall trait. They're, they're completely independent. The third law being the law of dominance. Uh, 
And this is where we see the dominant and recessive traits, where we have dominant and recessive traits, and if a dominant allele is passed over, that will always be the visible trait you see. Now, the funny thing about Mendel's findings is, is they went largely unnoticed for 30 years until somebody else independently discovered them and then started actually saying, hey, wait, this, this guy was onto something, and then uh, basically it was all rediscovered. So let's move on. Let's build some things. Everybody ready to see some code? Yeah. Yeah. See, we've got to make the whole room feel like it's full. And actually, for those at home, it is actually kind of full. Um, so let's see some code. Ha, you thought you were going to see code in the next slide. So let's actually just lay out everything that we have first. So we're going to need to basically build this whole system. We need a Petri dish. We need organisms. Uh, we need to have some way of having a gene pool that kind of lives outside of organisms. Um, this is kind of one of the problems I have. But the biological clock in the DNA store, uh, we need a biological clock to live and let this organism know when it lives and when it dies. And so that's actually the first thing that we're going to build. Before we worry about reproduction, before we worry about DNA storage, or any of the events that are going to be needed, we need to actually have something that lives, right? So we'll start simple. We'll create our Petri dish. We'll add, the, add an organism, which is a supervisor, which is actually going to supervise a set of processes, just like you, know, you supervise all the processes in your body. And we're going to have a biological clock, which will be a gen server. And then we're going to use a, a, a gen event to handle death. So basically, we're going to send a notification that says, hey, we're dead. Uh, it was funny when I was playing around with this. I, I was using logger so that I could see like, when things were firing off and stuff like that. And I had you know, nothing lasts forever, and then it would die. That's great. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's look at our Petri dish first. Now, a couple things to note, and this is one of the things I want to highlight. Now, we have these organisms, but you know what's great about Erlang is it'll restart processes for you. We don't want to restart them. We want them to die. So we, use, we say transient so that it doesn't start up immediately. We actually have to trigger it to start. And then we use a simple one-for-one -one strategy so that it doesn't restart, uh, restart automatically. Uh, this, yeah, this will actually keep them from automatically restarting after they die, which prevents any zombies, because we don't want organisms that are zombies. That's another movie and another, um, another talk, probably, at some point. So let's look at our organism. Now, this is actually in a module, but I kind of cut it, because, you know, on, of course, on the screen, um, it doesn't all fit. So pretend this is in a module, because it is. Um, so here's our organism. We're going to actually initiate the organism. We're going to pass in uh, some information about the organism. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to pass in the two gametes that are going to come together and form it. Um, now, we're using uh, what's, what's called uh, single gene inheritance, which is a nice, simple way of saying we're just going to take two genes and stick them together and move on. We're not going to take into consideration X-linked uh, inheritance, which has to do with like, whether or not it's on the, the uh, X chromosome or Y chromosome. You know, it, this is just simple stuff. We don't want to get too complicated. But one of the things that we want to say is we're going to use a struct in our organism because we want to kind of define some things. So like we're going to store like the name of this organism. Uh, we're going to have the birth time. We're also going to have an easy way to, say, to pass in these gametes. So we're going to have size, color, and speed. Now when I say speed, that's going to be our reproduction speed. And that's going to vary per organism based on the trait that's passed in. Now, when an, organism is, uh, when an organism is actually created, one of the things that we're going to do is, is we're going to create the organism. So we basically take the gametes that came into the organism at the time we start and pass it in. Uh, it's going to do some stuff. It's going to create a birth time, which is we just use Erlang system time, uh, which is nice and convenient. Uh, the name, everybody's going to love me, but I'm actually generating atoms on the fly and using the process that I'm using plus the birth time. Um, it was a nice handy way for me to be able to communicate. And you know what? This is never going to production, just to so um, But then what we do is, is we want to combine our traits. So we want to combine colors, we want to combine speed, and we want to combine uh, the size. <clears throat> this adds to our organism, and so we can pass that into our DNA. We'll get to that in a minute. So let's see. Now, the biological clock we want to look at, because that's our next server. So we need a biological clock that is going to actually kind of manage these life processes uh, at a different level. When we, when we kick off the biological <laughs> clock, it immediately, if you see, we do a process send after. So how fun is this? You know when you're going to die the second you're born. 
you know. Um, but what I did was, is, so I gave it a cap. I didn't want to necessarily say that you know, all these organisms are going to die at the same time, but I want them to die in a, a scope of time. So like everything else, this organism can actually go out and get hit by a bus earlier than it was expected. So I use random. Everybody loves random, right? So the death is actually set, and so the, we, send to, we send to itself um, a message of death. <laughs> Who thought it was going to be this fun, right? I'm telling you, debugging this thing was great. Um, so yeah, so you send a message of death at a, at a predetermined time based on um, a cap, basically. So it could die at any point in time that, it, that it's living. Uh, then we actually, um, actually, yeah. And so you see down here uh, our death function. Uh, we're just going to notify the bio events, which is our event manager for, uh, for all our events, uh, that death has happened and send the organism so that that way the Petri knows, dish knows that it's dead. Now, that's here. Kill organism. See? You get to write things like that. That's awesome. So when it comes in, it's just going to terminate the child process. So there we have it. We have life and death of an organism. Uh, we have a Petri dish that now starts up an organ, or we, when we tell it to start it up, it'll actually create a new organism. It'll put it in the Petri dish. It'll monitor it. Uh, and then at some point that's predetermined at, at birth, the organism will die. So now we need to store DNA. So we're going to use agent for this. How many are elixirists in here versus Erlangers? Elixirists. I thought everybody would raise their hand all at once. That would be awesome. Uh, all right, now Erlangers. How many are familiar of the Erlangers with an agent? OK. So an agent is basically a wrapper around gen server. It's just a kind of, uh, it's an abstraction for a gen server. Uh, and we use them typically in Elixir to store state. So we also have TAS, which is another wrapper around gen server, which is more for uh, single calls type things. Um, now the agent is not, uh, it's not only going to store the genes for a particular or organism, but it's also responsible for sharing the gametes. So when reproduction happens, you're going to call into the, uh, to the DNA store, and you're going to say, give me a gamete. Let's look at that. So here's our DNA. Did you think your DNA looked like this? No. This is awesome. So when you start the link, it's actually going to pass in the organism, and it's going to set the agent to the organism so that it can later on call it. There's my process name, which is going to put a lovely atom on there for me. Um, but then I can actually go down here, and we can see where we're retrieving the gametes. Now, this one right here. We're going to split the pairs. So remember what I said about the, the, the law of segregation and the independent assortment. So we're going to want to, we don't want anything to, w whether the color is passed over, we don't want that to have any influence on the, the speed of rep reproduction um, or the size of the, the organism. So we're going to split the pairs and we're going to split them individually. And so we also use down here, you can see where I use, um, is it on this slide? Yeah, I split pairs at random. So yeah, I'm using enum random to actually grab one of the two and just send it over. <coughs> All right, so now we're ready to move on to reproduction. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and add reproduction to the, to the biological clock. And if you see, we have about three functions in the middle of the screen there where we actually, based on the speed, remember we had those hetero, or heterozygote and homozygote uh, traits where we say if it's FF, that means that's the, the dominant trait, that's the fastest one that it could be. And so we're going uh, we're gonna to reproduce. Also, I use random here to where I say that it's not necessarily always, but it's at the max, uh, what, 2.5 seconds. So at some point in time, it's going to actually reproduce in that amount of time. Now, uh, the recessive, the FF, is the slowest possible reproduction rate. And then anything else, it's probably about an, it's an average of the two. It's totally scientific, trust me. I ran it past somebody. <laughs> Don't follow me up on that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to add our uh, biological event so that the reproduction handler is going to listen. Uh, when, when it's time to reproduce, it's going to send a signal, and then we're going to actually raise this event. The event's going to be caught and pass over its gametes into the gene pool, and then hopefully everything works. <coughs> so the gene pool and a spawn handler. So here's our gene pool. Now, if you'll notice at the top, I have uh, fitness, which 
we're going to actually use that as a gate. How many people are familiar with uh, genetic algorithms? Okay. How many people are familiar with fitness of a genetic algorithm? Okay. So we want to say that this is our model, or that like this is the perfect scenario. If I get this gamete, this is the the best possible mate for any organism because everybody wants to be really fast. And I'd switch these letters. That C is supposed to be a G, but I did it kind of last minute and didn't swap out the slides, so just bear with me. Um, but smaller organisms. So we want something that's small and reproduces fast, and it's going to be of the color green. And let's see. That's our fitness. So here's how we figure out the best match. We're actually going to call into best match. And we're going to see, we, we want to get the best match if it's there. But if it's not there, we're still going to try to reproduce because that's what organisms do. They just try to reproduce. So ideally, we've got uh, a pattern matching there to see as we're looping over the set that's in the gene pool, if it matches that fitness, that perfect match, it's going to use that one. And then if it doesn't, it's just going to grab one. Now, if it doesn't find any genes in the gene pool, it's just going uh, it's just going to basically leave the genes because keep in mind we're basically building plants here where you know and so the idea is that you know it's like pollen in the air sort of thing you know hopefully something gets it at some point. But we do actually have our uh, event to spawn the organism, which we're going to call back out and say when it comes time we're going to go ahead and spawn the organism, which is going to tell the petri dish to create a new organism based on the two gametes that it has, and there we have it added in there. Now, the real question that everybody's asking right now, does it work? I don't know. Yeah, seriously, I've tested this before. Trust me. Hold on. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually give it uh, two organisms. And I actually updated this. So remember all that commented out code? Well, it's not going to be commented out anymore. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, let's see. Hold on. Bear with me. OK, so here's our code. So we're going to have, we have two organisms that are passing in uh, two different gametes. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to spin up two brand new organisms. And let's see what we see here. No. All right. So you see the DNA is actually spit out to the screen. Now, based on the time, it looks like some of them are slower and the anticipation. Oh, look, we got a couple of yellow ones. Are, new, are these new organisms? Yes, these are all spawning new organisms. They're going through the whole process of uh, reproduction. And the other thing is, if I can show you this. Yeah, so if we can zoom in. This is really hard to do when it's on my screen. It's even harder to do. OK, let's see. I'm going to try to find one. But keep in mind, that, oh, see this over here? I know, exactly. When will you run out of memory? Mm, I don't know, let's see. Um, what's funny is, is in Observer, at some point, Observer just craps out and is like, I'm done, you know? Um, all right, let's kill these because we're going to go ahead and add some more. Uh, let's see. All right, let's see here, clear. All right, ready? Oh, 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 I'm trying to catch them quick. They start like blowing up and then, okay, so it'll be slow at first. Let me see if I can grab this and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So originally what I did was I had started down the path of actually having like a Petri dish you could see and dropping organisms in there. The problem with it is, is most of it was in JavaScript. Almost actually all of it was in JavaScript. And so I was basically having to report through. Uh, I'm going to see if I can talk and see if I can actually crash my laptop. Because I know Joe really wants to see a laptop crash in one of these. Um, so the problem with it was is there was like so much code I would have to explain like how I actually did that. I was like, OK. And believe it or not, I was actually going to talk about both uh, mitosis and meiosis. And I was like, OK, I, I've got to cut stuff out. because. Uh, it's too long. Most people are going to just want the conference, you know, to grab a beer or something like that. So, uh, yeah, this is actually for Erlang. Uh, it's what is it? Uh, Ubigraph? Yeah. Um, he needs the predator's name. Yeah, I know. 
<laughs> well, see, what's fun is you can, like, zoom into these, and somewhere you can find the Petri dish. Where are they all at? Uh, no, I haven't. No, it's what it is is the, oh, yeah, they probably all. So at some point, so the problem with this, is, okay, like in a typical like DNA strand, I mean, when you're talking about like humans, you have a, like a, a, actually, I'm going to kill this because I do have some more to talk about. Um, and, yeah, they are kind of all just the same. So you'd have like a larger spectrum of traits and things like that, so you would have more variation. Keep in mind, genetics is way more complicated than I just made it. Um, it's just, and, and I mean, there's all sorts of things, like even seeing a trait, depending on where it is in the actual chain, like maybe if it's closer to this uh, trait than this trait, then it might appear if it doesn't. You know, there's all sorts of like crazy like logic behind it. Um, and I, I mean, actually, it's as complicated as they started working on it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to map the human genome in like 1988, I think it was, somewhere, like it was in like the 80s. You know when they finished it? 2003. And really, the way they finished it was, it's as done as we can get it because we don't know the rest. Is basically the summary. So you know, exactly. So let's see. All right. Oh, see, I just said let's see, and the sign says let's see. All right. Well, we did that. So we have more organisms. So I know what you're asking yourself right now. What was the point of the first part of the talk, other than the genetics thing? Well, see, there's, there's really nothing new here at all. And especially, I'm sure the people out there in Erlang are like, okay, so you spun up a few processes. What's the big deal? Well, everything that I built existed. It was all there even before Elixir. Uh, I leveraged OTP, which has been around since the mid-'90s. Uh, and Erlang's been around for more than a decade before that. But Mendel didn't invent genetics. <coughs> And Darwin didn't invent evolution. What they did was they shared the discoveries that they found. Now, this is something, and actually Dave's talk, it was kind of funny sitting in the Dave's talk, because it's very similar to the talk that I'm going to give. So I started this My Elixir status thing. I don't know if anybody's seen that on the internet. People, you know, probably say, what the hell is all this My Elixir status stuff? Well, it's really about sharing your discoveries. The problem with a new language is, you might be on, in Argentina, uh, you know, Dave in Texas, and you both find this great thing. But you don't know about the other person, and you don't know that it's there. Well, if that happens and that persists, then how does the language grow? So the fact is, we have to share what we discover. This is all great tools. This conference, I was here two years ago, and it's a completely different feel. The, the community's grown. The community's gotten bigger. Everybody, I remember like the first time I was here, you know, Elixir was like, okay, yeah, the, the Elixir kid's over in the back. You know, don't worry about it. But this year, we're right in the middle of everything else. And the thing is, is the community has to work together to grow. And the only way we're going to do that is we're going to share the discoveries that we're going to find. Because the thing is, is I go out and I present to people, and they're like, yeah, well, sure, sure it's faster. You say it's faster. Well, then Chris goes out and proves it. We can talk about things. We can actually say, yes, this is great. But until we prove it to people, until we show our discoveries, they're not going to make sense. They're not going to believe you. And so we can either just sit back and just enjoy our language and just enjoy working on what we work on, or we can go out and share people and convince other people that this is a great thing and we should participate in it. So my lecture status, if anybody wants to know, is all about discovery. Letting everybody know what you're working on and sharing it. And, you know, I've had a lot of great feedback on it. I've had a lot of people say, you know, I discovered Elixir, and then I discovered my Elixir status, and it made me realize that there's other people using it. So that's all I have. Thank you all. <laughs> and my laptop didn't crash. All right, so any questions? Yeah, and so, I mean, so the problem with random is it's random, and there's only two. So at some point, if you end up starting to get in, you can get stuck in a loop. And what I found is I'm surprised that it did it with more. 
Uh, I found it happened more frequently when I had less organisms to start with because it was like, I guess, a shorter time, you would think. Now, we could probably change some of these, and it would last longer. Because, but, I mean, it's, it's kind of like when you look at the, the Punnett Square where it's like, yeah, 50%, 56% of the time. But there's still that 6%. And if that 6% ends up, for some reason, just an anomaly and it happens more often than you would think, um, you know, you're going to end up running into a scenario with this. But, yeah, I've, I've had several test scenarios. The cool thing about this is it's different every time I run it. Sometimes it lasts longer. Sometimes it lasts shorter. Sometimes it's kind of like because it's, it's splitting, and, and, there, and there's, no, there's no logic behind it. It's like it's either taking one or the other, and each one is separate, so it's always giving one or the other. So, Anybody else? I do need to add predators. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to do was add food, because my thought was is I could, if I could draw it all out and have it into our food, so adding to that biological clock of uh, saying that, yes, you might be ready to mate, but the, the need for food trumps that, so you have to go eat. So you can't reproduce until you've fed, and then, then you can reproduce. And, so, and if you don't feed in a certain amount of time, then you would die, and you would, you're, you know, the genes wouldn't. So yeah, you can make this as complicated as you wanted. Yes? I didn't count. How many yeah, um, I don't. I didn't actually get a count on them. Usually, I just let it run and watch it for a few minutes. And but I mean, <laughs> it's getting. I mean, I'm sure it gets into the thousands pretty quick. Because it, it, it's too. It's funny. Like we'll start it up again real quick. Uh, I think we got time, right? Change the size of the atom table. Change the size of the atom table. Yeah, we can put a thousand max, and then we know it will die at like 900. Yeah. Well, here, I, I want to show this real quick. So if you notice, like, the first two drop in, and then they reproduce. Now, this rate right here is slow. But in a few seconds, you're going to have enough organisms, and you're going to have a, a shorter reproduction time on those organisms, and to where they're going to start, like, just, like, throwing, like, yeah, probably any second now. Yeah, and then the reproduction rate uh, increases, which means your process reproduction rate. Um, somebody asked me, like, what is this even good for? Well, when you think about it, if you wanted to have something that was like spinning up to like test different like fitness levels, so like say you had um, you wanted to test the validity of a system based on certain scenarios, and so you wanted to just kind of bang on a system, you could do something like this and try to figure out what the optimal settings are for that system. Um, yeah, see now it's just taking off. But yeah, so it does a lot. Yeah, it like. I've seen this lock up. I've, I've seen observer uh, throw errors, like it can't write to observer fast enough. Like yeah. uh, oh, that one locked up. I didn't even stop that. Yeah. I mean, I'm on a laptop, so. <laughs> but, yeah. So, cool. Anything else? All right. Well, I hope you all enjoyed. Thanks.